Okay, hello. Good evening. Thank you for coming out in the rain. I'm Ann Olazabel. I'm the interim dean here at the Miami Herbert Business School, and I'm just up here to welcome you to tonight's event. Uh, this is pretty exciting. We've got quite the lineup. Before we get started, uh, thank you so much and welcome to alumni who are here. I see some alumni in the, in the room. I see faculty, of course, students, our staff. I see members of the Board of Trustees, Manny Cadre. Uh, who else is here? Uh, Marshall Ames from Lennar, uh, Dave Lieberman, who many of you may know, um, some years back retired uh, from the University of Miami, so thank you for coming back to visit us. Uh, Joe Echevarria, who's our CEO, thank you for being here. President Frank, of course, uh, we don't do these things without you. Um, and many, many others who are here, so thank you so much for coming. Um, I, I'm just going to introduce uh, one of the pair of dignitaries up here, uh, and he almost needs no introduction, as he and his family have been longtime friends and generous supporters of the university. The executive chairman of Lennar, Stewart's relationship with the University of Miami, spans many, many years and in many roles. He's an alumnus of the law school, class of 1982, a parent of a University of Miami graduate, a hurricane fan, a member of the UM Board of Trustees, chair of the U Health Board, chair of the university's ever brighter, the campaign for our next century fundraising effort, and men, in many other ways, he is a big supporter of the university. Today, he's the moderator of our fireside chat with Nelson Peltz. We are very grateful to Stuart for introducing his friend Nelson to us and bringing him to Miami Herbert to headline today's distinguished leaders lecture. With that said, I'll turn the mic over to Stuart to introduce our keynote speaker. Well, hello everyone. Let me see what I got here. So let me tell you, this is a privilege for all of us to have Nelson Peltz, uh, who I consider a friend here with us. And I want to I wanna introduce Nelson by telling a quick story. And he might disavow. He might say this is not exactly accurate. But I'm going to tell you my recollection, because it goes back a ways. And so let, let me just say, I, I met Nelson back in the 1990s. Um, and I can't even tell you the circumstances under which we met. But it was back in those days that from time to time, I would get a call, and we would end up having a lunch. And it was generally a lunch. Nelson honored me by wondering what's going on in the housing business, wanted to get a perspective from somebody who was in the business, and we kind of got to know each other. And, you know, we would get together from time to time. I was an aspiring, young, evolving, public company executive, and Nelson was Nelson Peltz. I mean, he was an activist shareholder. He was known by everybody. He struck fear in the hearts and minds of leaders in the public company world. Yes, you did. Uh huh. Not and you, I, Stuart. You weren't scared. <laughs> no, I figured if I could stay a little friendly, maybe he'd stay away. <laughs> That's why you bought lunch, right? <laughs> Well, at one lunch, he had an idea, and he broached the concept that perhaps, perhaps we should go and try to buy a particular home building company together, and we'd do it jointly. I knew the CEO of the company. I knew him quite well, and I welcomed the possibility of doing it with Nelson and his partners. What an opportunity to learn. Up close, personal, get to see it firsthand, we agreed to go visit, strike up a conversation, and to see if we could make something happen. I had actually tried before with this company, and I had failed. So I figured we'd give it another try, right? So <laughs> this, I, have, I presume to counsel my friend Nelson on an approach. I know the CEO. He's a very, very nice man. Let's start with some niceties. 
Let's let the conversation develop and mature, and then we'll migrate to a more serious conversation, a discussion. I felt like the aggressive approach would be a little overwhelming, and it probably wouldn't work so well. OK, so we go to Naples. We meet at the restaurant, restaurant, and I whisper one more time on the way in, don't forget the niceties. <laughs> Because CEO is a very nice guy. He's very proud. <laughs> and Nelson said, with certainty, as if this is not my first rodeo, don't worry, I got this. <laughs> so, OK, great. Deep breath. I'm ready to learn from the master, right? So we arrive at the table. We all introduce ourselves to each other. We sit. And before the bread hits the table, Nelson announced with his overwhelming presence and his strong, self-assured voice, which you'll see in a minute, Al, we want to buy your company. We think it's going to be a good deal for you. We think it's going to be a good deal for your shareholders. And it's going to be a good deal for us as well. What do you think? <laughs> well, so much for the niceties. <laughs> the lunch was short. The deal didn't get done. And I was a little shell-shocked. But boy, did I learn. I'm pretty sure that the deal wouldn't have gone, gotten done anyway. It just wasn't the right circumstance. But I did have a front row seat to a straight shot, hard-hitting direct conversation, no waste of time, clear, not confusing, sharp focus, targeted, determined approach to a clearly defined target. It was an engagement that to this day, I've never forgotten. The reality is that this is Nelson Peltz. Today, he's a friend, and I've had the joy and the honor to have learned a lot about the business world from a legendary leader. Nelson began in business a lot like I did, working for and with his father and his grandfather's company and learning and evolving to be his own unique style of business participant. Years later, Nelson had become an extraordinary operator. He sold the business, and then he and his partners built an equity capital asset management business focused on investing in a small number of businesses that could benefit from some warm but hard-hitting direct conversation, no waste of time, clear and not confusing, sharp focus, and targeted advice in order to improve the business. Nelson and his partners have worked with companies like Snapple, Heinz, Kraft Foods, Bank of New York, Ingersoll Rand, Wendy's, DuPont, Mondelez and PepsiCo, Procter and Gamble, GE, Disney. These are the kinds of companies that Nelson chooses to identify, and to work with. Many would call Nelson Peltz an activist investor. I think I've read that Nelson would better refer to himself as a, construction, a constructivist investor, meaning that he has the strong foundation of being a real operator. He leans on that foundation to look for extraordinary companies that can build and enhance shareholder value with some strong, targeted focus on bottom line accountability and operational focus. He invests, and he seeks to influence management. He often makes strong friendships and business relationships along the way, although it doesn't always feel friendly at the beginning. But let me tell you, am I wrong? No, you're right. <laughs> that, I'm proud of that very much. So. But let me tell you, let me tell you that Nelson is a force, and Nelson is a joy, and Nelson is a friend. And if you have an opportunity to learn, as we do here today, hang on every word, because every engagement with Nelson Peltz is a business school class. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Nelson Peltz. That was so nice. <laughs> is that what I did? Oh, God. <laughs>
<laughs> you don't remember. Yeah, I do remember. <laughs> you remember. Okay, let's, uh, let's I, talk. I decided to use the, uh, the sweet approach with Al, okay? <laughs> I had bread, okay. and then I said it, you know. Well, you didn't have bread first. <laughs> you just got right down to it. So, so listen, I, I, I want to start... I want to start with a couple of things and then I want to migrate to a couple of areas because there's a lot to talk about. And Nelson, I can't help it with Brittany sitting here right in the front row. Um, tell us a little bit about your family and a little bit about your history. But let's start with the family because I don't think that you got the memo that in, in a modernized society, generally two to three children is about the right amount. Is the TV was broken. <laughs> <laughs> what can I tell you? I have 10 kids, OK? And I'm Jewish. My wife is Catholic. It made no difference. We had my first marriage, I had two. My current and last marriage, I have eight, two sets of twins. And they range in age from 40 to 20. And I want to tell you something. I learn so much from my kids. So much. They, are, they don't even know how much they teach me. I'm 81 years old. I have friends who are 81 years old. They go to dinner at 4.30 in the afternoon. Okay, the day is over. Okay, I'm not kidding you. Maybe five if they're gonna have a late night. I, got, I, I'm, I'm, I sat up with two of my kids and one of their friends last night to 1.30 in the morning. We just were talking. Do you know how much you can learn from talking? One was 30, one was 20 and their friend was 35. We talked for three, four hours. Do you know how much you can learn from that? I can learn so much. I can learn what products they use. I can learn what they're thinking about, their concerns, the opportunities they see. It's amazing how much I get from all my kids, so I want you to know I have all these kids for business reasons. <laughs> Brittany, I'm sorry to tell you that. I got a grandson here too, Ben, okay? And maybe I might have even a son here, but I haven't seen that redhead anywhere. Uh, he's heard me speak so many times, he's sick of it. There's a redhead in the middle. He's not the one, is he? No, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> But you know, look, juxtapose, your kids are a learning experience, but I just watched as Brittany came up to you, uh, missed Rosh Hashanah dinner, and got a big warm hug yep. that you're leaving town tomorrow, not gonna be here for the weekend. And there's a clear, because I've been around, I don't think I've been around all your kids yet, but I've been around most of a them. A lot of them. And right. the affection, the engagement, the, the, the mentoring that you share with each of them is really remarkable. So let, let's go back a little bit because I think it's worthwhile to take a look at your history, your business trajectory. Um, you don't make, you don't mince words about the fact that you didn't graduate college. Nope. Um, you like skiing, you didn't like class so much. <laughs> and so tell us a little bit about that migration from those early years, starting with college, migrating on, and developing your business career? Well, I, I, I don't want you all to take a lesson from what I'm gonna tell you, and I know the dean is not thrilled about this, that you guys might leave after hearing this story. Uh, but I went to Wharton, and I had a wonderful time in my short period there. I just didn't get to class that much. And when I did get to class, I couldn't figure out when I was gonna use accounting and finance and economics. It just was a blur. I was way too immature to be in a place like that. 
So I dropped out and I went up to Maine and skied. And so I washed dishes and I got a ski ticket and I got two meals. And it was great. And you got to plan ahead, you see. And the snow melted, which I didn't plan on. Then I went, what was I going to do? So I had a job offered to me out in Mount Hood, Oregon in July to teach some young kids skiing. And uh, I needed some money to get out. And my dad had a, a very small but nicely profitable produce business, a very small business. He was doing about $2 million a year and uh, f supporting a family nicely on that. And uh, I asked him if he could give me a job on a truck, 100 bucks a week for two weeks. And he said yes if I shaved my beard off, which I told him was temporary, and I did. Uh, and he set me up because I said, Dad, you know, there are a lot of opportunities that we're missing here. He said, so why don't you stay here and do them instead of running out to Mount Hood, Oregon, and which I did. And basically, in a very short order, he threw the keys on the table and said, go fetch. And we built that $2 million business into almost $150 million a year business, took it public, and then we were the largest in our industry in the Northeast at that point in time. And I sold that business. And I hired my chief financial officer, Peter May, and he then became a partner. And we were looking around for something new to do. And uh, long story short, we started a little, a little business that fixed companies that had financial difficulties. And I learned a lot about cash. So I don't want to go there just yet. Okay. I want to back up a second. Two million dollar company to a hundred and fifty million dollar company. Sounds like there's some operational grit and some focus and determination and accountability embedded in getting from one place to the next. Talk a little bit about that. Well, my father went to work at 4.30 in the morning because that's what they do in the produce business in the old days. And he came home at dinner time. And he did that five and a half to six days a week. And he supported a family nicely doing that. With, and he had to touch everything. And when I told him I wanted to make an acquisition in Boston, he said to me, who's going to be there to make sure the trucks get out on time? Which was his way of thinking, how the hell do you build a business when you're not there to touch everything? I said, Dad, we're going to work it out. And he, he really gave me the reins, and I was fortunate enough to be able to finance it. And then I bought a company in Philadelphia, and then I bought a company in Baltimore, Washington, and then we had the Northeast, and we took it public. And then we got an offer to sell it, and I was thrilled to sell it, because it wasn't a great cash flow business. And I learned very, very early on that cash flow is the most important thing there is. The markets every now and then pay sales, they pay eyeballs, they pay for all of these other things. But let me tell you something, there ain't nothing like cash flow. And that's what counts in business. And so from there, and Mike Milken was, became a good friend of mine at the end of the 60s, a guy you may never have heard of who was a a denizen of Wall Street back in those days, Saul Steinberg, who was a great friend of mine. He introduced me to Michael. I started trading with Michael, and then I bought control of a broken down company called Triangle Industries. I was losing money, but it had a good balance sheet, and I needed a balance sheet. 
and we put on the front cover that we were going to build that into a major industrial force. It had a market cap in those days of maybe 20 million bucks. And we did. We then bought, financed the company up, bought National Can, bought American Can, built lots of new factories around the world, and created the largest packaging company in the world. And then we sold it to the French government when Mitterrand was president. OK, so I'm still, I'm still working with you here. Okay. You, you, two million to 150 million, got to learn the business, got to buy a couple of additional businesses, and somehow Mike Milken fits in there. How'd okay, you meet well, Mike? Well, first of all, you, I, I told my father we needed a computer. He said, what the hell? He said, you can't. <coughs> he said a computer's not going to work in this business. You've got too many prices, too many items. We probably had 100 items, you know, 500 customers. Everybody had a different price, different item. He's just never going to work. I thought he was right the night that we installed the computer because I stayed up for two straight nights and couldn't get a damn invoice out. But ultimately, we got it to work. And, and you know, you do these little things, and it's like going to business school. It was a real teach-in for me. And, and my friend Saul in, in introduced me to Michael. I had a little tax loss carry forward, and I told Michael I needed a capital gain. He told me to buy Penn Central bonds at 29. He got me par. I said, boy, this is a smart guy. And Michael and I would speak every single day, and he would always call me at 7 AM to make sure I knew that he was in the office in LA earlier than I was in the office in New York. That was standard procedure. Leave a message at 7. Tell Nelson I called. He should be at work. Uh, and, and Michael and I developed a, an amazing relationship. And then uh, I used him and others to finance acquisitions and was able to pay ridiculous interest rates for businesses that were not being managed. And from businesses that were not being managed, like American Can and others, I then went from there to becoming an activist and found out that are really big businesses that aren't being managed, like Procter & Gamble. Think about that. The biggest consumer company in the world, I felt it needed help. <laughs> that was pretty brash. So I, I'm going to be a little presumptuous again. Okay, I've, got, go ahead. I've got to shepherd. What am I missing? I've got to shepherd you a little bit because you said something that's really interesting to me, and it's reminiscent of some things that I, I've seen as well, and that is that computer. What do we need a computer for? Your dad said, mm -hmm. and um, and you said that you know pricing was all over the place for all the things and everything, but migrating to that first computer was a lot of tinkering, a lot of working a lot of technical stuff, and you'll learn a lot. It's like going to business school. Yep. Just in my, I, I, I had that experience. <laughs> I did. Yeah. We, 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 were, we were buying a home building company. We were a little company at the time, buying a little home building company. And we're up in Broward County doing due diligence. And my father walked in the room, walks in the room. We're, we're all getting together. And he says, oh my god, the waste in this company, it's unbelievable. Do you know what they have? They don't have one. They have two PCs. They call those, right. those are personal computers. Right. What are they gonna do with those? I, <laughs> that, that he, I think your father was talking to my father. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But, but the, 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 the question I, I, I have is, that migration from what was done to start a business to what goes on to elevate a business and the business school componentry of that. I think about that as I think about what you did later on as a stepping stone. And I just thought maybe you could take a minute and talk 
about let, learning about the operation. Let, let, let me interrupt you for a second. I'm, I'm going to get back to your, your, your question. You're right. I mean, that, those first days of trying to get a computer to work, I had the pleasure of spending time last week with Sam Altman from AI. I mean, when I think in my lifetime, I went from, we all went, from handwriting invoices to a contaminator operator trying to get out statements at the end of the month to open AI. And they all think that this is going to be smarter than all of us in the room, which I cannot accept, OK? They all think it's going to be smarter than us eventually. That in my lifetime, I've seen that that movie is truly amazing. It gives me goosebumps at my age to see where we have come as a world technologically, and yet we've left so much behind socially. It's, it's amazing. Now let's go back to your question. So the, the migration from bookkeeping to the, to the wor world of computers and the evolution of a young Nelson Peltz to learn operational excellence, accountability, how the numbers fit together. How does that evolution? That was my happen? Wharton School story. Right. That was my Wharton School. That was my MBA. I mean, when you do it, when you make a sale, make sure it gets there on time, and then you collect it. Collecting it sometimes is the hardest part of all. OK? You now have gone to business school. And that's how I learned my trade. I learned it the hard way. I felt a great disadvantage because I didn't graduate from college. And in the 60s, not having a college degree was a real negative. Today, sometimes it's glorified a little bit. But back then, if you didn't have a college degree, you were a truck driver. Uh, but that's how I, that was, for me, and not for every, anybody else, it was my way of learning. And from that experience, I could go, Stuart, to a company like Procter & Gamble and tell them what I think they're doing wrong. How dare I go to them and tell them <laughs> what they were doing wrong. And you know something? They told me to take a hike. So I went to shareholders, and we had a proxy fight. And we won. And the company really prospered. It really prospered. Market shares went up, and margins went up. Nobody got fired. Nobody. There was no new acquisitions, no new divestitures. No new debt. It was just running the business more logically. I don't want to waste everybody's time unless they want to hear what happened. No, that's what, that, that's what we're here for. OK, no, OK. It's stepping stones. You learn about operations, and then you can teach operations. When you have that foundation and you know what to do, you can invest and you can affect. So and how did that happen? Let, let me tell you what it was. This was a company of 100,000 employees. It was 100,000 employees when I started, and it was 100,000 employees when I finished. So nobody got fired. But here was the structure of the company. There was a CEO, and in reality, 100,000 people reported to this one CEO. There were people who had sales responsibility, market share responsibility, accounting responsibility, manufacturing responsibility, but nobody had a P&L except the boss. What we wound up doing after we won the proxy fight, and they were great, they then brought in uh, McKinsey to vet our proposal. McKinsey accepted about 85% of it, and they made some good changes as well. 
But what we wound up with was seven CEOs, not one, but seven CEOs internally who had everything, manufacturing, distribution, marketing, advertising, everything. And they had 11,000 people in corporate when we got there. We wound up, we wanted 1,000, we got down to 4,000. Those 7,000 weren't fired, they were put in the businesses. So now you had accountability for everybody except 4,000 people. And that's what drove that company forward, just logic. It was just logical. It was badly structured. And that's what we did at DuPont, and that's what we did at Heinz, and that's what we did all over the place. We're just an unpaid uh, a consulting firm so would it who be, happens to own stock. Would it, would, it be, would it be relevant to say that some of these companies, some companies, great brands, great programs, find themselves on an evolutionary track where little by little they meander away from bottom line accountability and it's almost like a corrective surgery to get them to realign and rethink and take some bitter medicine to get to a better place and build shareholder value. Stuart, you know what's amazing? You go into these companies and every board I've been on, there was no one on that board that actually wrote a check to buy stock except us. Every board. They got stock, they got options, they got this, they got that, they sold some options, they bought some stock, they paid their tax. No investment from the CEO on down. Every single company, I was the only guy on the board who wrote a check to buy stock. That clears your sinuses. <laughs> it really does. When you got three and a half billion dollars in a company like P&G, you got, you're going to work every day. Let me tell you, you're going to work every day to make sure you, you get that company and start to dance. And everybody was so polite, so nice. Once the proxy fight was over, they were welcoming and they were nice. And when I got off the board, they gave me a beautiful award and said the nicest things about me in the press. You know why? Because most of the compensation in P&G was stock-based. And they had made millionaires out of employees a decade ago, but for the prior decade, they hadn't made any millionaires, you know? <laughs> and, and it was a proxy fight. It was the biggest one ever. Off the beaten path a little bit. I mean, you. you I'm always off the beaten path. No, no, no. I'm going to ask a question that's off the beaten path. You go in, you, you, you go in, you buy some stock, you have a little proxy fight, you go through some agitation, and you walk into a board uh, or to an executive's office. These are, these, are, these are people that are quite accomplished. Yeah. And you say, Hi, I'm Nelson Peltz. I'm here to help. That's, what what that, happened? It's 100% what, right. What happens that's what we're, then? Here's what we do. I mean, we've had 35 of these engagements. Only three of them wound up in a real fight. Think about that. They didn't love the fact that I was there, but they figured, you know, it's better to work with this guy than to fight with this guy. I mean, P&G spent $100 million to keep me off their board, $100 million. A lot of these companies don't want to do that. So they give me a board seat. They expect me that maybe I'll sit in the corner. Give me one board seat. Oh, that's a mistake. Okay. You're not going to sit in the corner. I know that. And one thing you say, what can one board seat do out of 12 people? Well, let me tell you something. Every chairman wants every decision to be unanimous. God forbid it goes the wrong way, 100% of the board is culpable. I can give you chapter and verse, story after story, on things that none of you would vote for. None of you. And yet they're being proposed. So it kind of goes back to my lunch <laughs> where we looked at buying a company together, that straight discussion, the willingness to break through a wall 
and say, I'm not going to follow the herd, big part of you being a constructivist, thinking and doing, not just rabble-rousing, but in fact, crafting solutions that actually have long-term impact and make for a better company and shareholder value is a core value of what you're doing. That's correct. Let me tell you, if you look at what we do, what most activists do are balance sheet related. Sell something, leverage up, buy back stock, all balance sheet related. That's not what makes companies great. But company, what makes companies great is to get sales up, keep the margin or expand the margin. Simple as that. And get more market share. That's what makes companies great. Okay? You've got to be in business. You've got to understand business in order to talk to one of these people. Every one of the companies that we've involved, been involved with ha have had that same thing. We've had that kind of effect. I've made mistakes. We made one big one, which my buddy here is going to bring up, so <laughs> bring it up early, GE. But I want to tell you something. We eat, what am I right, Stu? Yes, you Okay, are. okay. We eat our own cookie. Then all of a sudden, we hear stories, okay, that something they did, listen to this, 2002, they're changing the accounting entry on their on a business they sold on retiree health benefits. This was 2017, 15 years later. We went back to make sure we didn't miss anything in any of the 10Ks. It was never, ever mentioned that they kept this liability back. The stock starts to sink. Jeff calls me up at 6 in the morning and said, Nelson, I'm thinking. I said, Jeff, don't finish the sentence. Goodbye. Stop thinking. Go. Because he was lying to the public the whole time. And take your CFO with you, OK? I I'm so, I'm try to be a little gentle most of the time, but that time I couldn't help myself. So he left. They tried a guy from inside the company. Didn't work. Meantime, the, the stock keeps dropping, dropping, dropping. We need a new CEO. I got my eye on a guy called Larry Culp. He just retired from Danaher. He's enjoying life teaching at the Harvard Business School. I go up to Boston. I said, Larry, this isn't for you. He says, what do you mean? I said, this isn't for you. You, you. Look, you're not a teacher. You've got to go back to work. He said, my wife will kill me. I said, Larry, please. He came to work. He wanted to kill me after that. But let me tell you something. This guy took this company that should have gone bankrupt. I've never met an industrial executive as good as Larry Culp. He they had, I told you P&G had 11,000 people in corporate. You will not believe this number. GE had 20,000 people in corporate. Can you imagine that? You know how many bricklayers that is? That's, it's okay. a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> you can build some homes. That's right. <laughs> we should have given them a job, right? I just Average want you to remind me, are you talking about a mom and pop company or is this GE you're talking this about? This GE. Okay. Okay. And Larry actually saved the company from bankruptcy. We still held that stock. We eat our own cookie. We are about even. Healthcare is going next. Aerospace is, is going to be the final piece. The pieces of the business are magnificent. One man, one woman can make an amazing difference in a company. So this was, the, this was a train wreck, and this guy saved it. So we're, I, I know we're going to run short on time, and there are a couple of other things I want to cover. But um, you say one, one person.
can make a difference. Oh, yeah. And Larry Culp is that person. But I, I just want to editorialize for a second and say maybe it's just one step before Larry Culp. Maybe it's that person that calls them like they see them, that sometimes says the emperor is not wearing clothes, that the glory days of mergers and acquisitions and accounting. Bad accounting. Bad accounting can cover a lot of ills mm -hmm. in the largest and most renowned of companies. And sometimes we have to come in and say, I'm looking at a picture. And the picture that you present to the world is not the picture that I see. And change is needed. That's and there's got to be an agent for change that says a CEO needs to leave, a CFO needs to leave. We have to start a new day. And it seems to me that a lot of organizations go through that time horizon of growth and greatness and then some sloppiness and maybe some reconciliation. Do you know the GE is the only company where we lost a CEO. Every one of our engagements, the CEO stayed and became friends of ours. In a Heinz proxy fight, that CEO became one of our advisory partners. But you're right, Stuart. You can't, you, you, you've got to look through things, and all of us can be fooled. But be careful of the guy who asks you to buy his stock. That's the lesson you can learn. Be careful of that. <laughs> so, so Nelson, I, 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 I see the time going. I, I don't want to. I don't want to keep everyone too long. But there, there's, there's another theme here that I just gotta, I gotta find my way to, and that is, from humble beginnings, two million dollar company to a hundred and fifty million dollar company to a next evolution, to buying some stock, becoming an activist taking all of your tools. It seems to me that underneath it all, there's this landscape. I think about my friend Armando Codino. Armando Codino was an immigrant to the United States, and he lives his life with a theme. He named his boat that theme, what a country. Mm. And if you think about somebody that came here from Cuba with not a nickel in his pocket, and finds his way to greatness, the underlayment is an incredible landscape and an incredible country. What about the United States today? Is oh. it, does it have the world of opportunity that you grew up in? Are there better opportunities? Are there, where, where do we stand today? And what do you think? What, it breaks my heart, Stuart, because this country still has such amazing, maybe more opportunity than when you were younger and when I was younger, more opportunity. Today, people can do things. I, I see it in tech. You kids see it in tech. I mean, because of what the people that have been coming to my house, the young folk, I see what they do in tech. It's mind-boggling what they have accomplished. And they only come here to America. They don't go anywhere else. You know, I, I, I was saying earlier that when we were standing in the hall, a few years ago, you heard China saying 2028, bigger than the US. 2030, bigger than the US and Europe together. OK? Ain't happening now. Not happening. That economy is going in the wrong direction. They have deflation. We don't know how to deal with deflation. Maybe you'll study that or you've studied already. Inflation, we know what to do. You take a hammer with it and just keep beating it with higher and higher interest rates. I don't know what you do about deflation. They got it. They've been lying about their population. The whole place is a figment, okay? This country has shown itself through this, whatever we just went through, this down cycle we're going through, the greatest country in the world by far. But look at the problems we have. 
Look at the, the social problems. Look at, and I'm not being political, look at the two candidates we have, potential candidates for president. I don't care which one you hate, or both, I hate both of them. <laughs> so you can know that, okay? E equally hate them both, okay? So the, the, the point is that you people have to figure out a way to make this place better. When I was a kid, Ronald Reagan, a conservative right-wing Republican president, could have a cup of coffee with Tip O'Neill, who led the House as a left-wing Democrat. They could have a cup of coffee, and in 15 minutes, they resolved all the difficulties there were. These people won't even get in the same room together. It's your job, not mine anymore, your job to change that. You may have a friend who is of a different party affiliation than you. Talk to each other. I grew up, I spoke to everybody, everybody spoke to everybody. You didn't have to vote for the same guy. And, the, and America was filled with centrist Democrats and centrist Republicans. And there wasn't that much difference, and that's what propelled this country going forward. It's up to you folks to make sure we get back there and get realistic and logical about the next step forward. I don't mean to be standing on a soapbox here, but I am very passionate about leaving a better country than I found for my 10 kids and their kids. And I'm telling you right now, I'm failing. And you folks here, you're the next generation. You can help that problem. So remember that. If whatever party your friend is of, talk about it. Talk. So, yeah, look, on a I don't want to leave it on a sour note because on a closing <laughs> note, there have been times. I mean, you grew up in the Vietnam War and McCarthyism Absolutely. and all of those remnants, and we had a civil war and stuff like that. All is not lost. We're going through a little bit of a rough patch here, and we can fix some things. Um, it has been a pretty interesting run. I, th I, will, I will say, just bringing it all together, I was watching CNBC one day. And on comes my friend Nelson Peltz, and he's talking about Disney. He had just gone through a bit of a... Almost, an almost. A, 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 bit, a bit of a, a, little, a little turmoil. And you, you were ready to acquiesce and to move on and to see better days and everything. And I will not forget, I was in like Houston or something like that, and I'm watching this on a TV in the lobby of a hotel, and Nelson comes on and explains his position, where he started, why he took on the fight, and why he threw in the towel at a point where his point had been made and the point had been recognized. He, uh, that was a proxy fight you didn't win. Is that right? It was right? a proxy fight we didn't have. You didn't have. It was threatened, though. Oh, it was more than threatened. It was, <laughs> it more, was, than threatened. Threatened. It was more than threatened. It was more than threatened. I have more to say on that subject, but go ahead. <laughs> well, it, it's certainly live as things sit right now because the company is going through its turmoil. Bottom line is when we have an opportunity to sit, to talk, to chat, to learn, to understand the growth, the trajectory, when we listen to Nelson Peltz, and the trials that he's gone through, the successes, and some of the pitfalls and failures, it is a business school lesson unto itself. And so with that, I say thank you, Nelson, for joining us here at the U.S. Thank you so much. Before Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Just that quickly introduce President Frank, who's going to make a few closing remarks.
Oh. President Frank sit, no. has yep. been president of the University of Miami since 2015, and he has many, many accolades, too many to name, uh, but professorships in the School of Medicine, in the School of Health, Health and, Health and Nurse, uh, Nursing and Health Studies, in the College of Arts and Sciences. So for all of you students here, um, he is in fact also not just a medical doctor, but a professor. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, President Frank. Well, I don't want to be anticlimactic because this was a fantastic close. I just want to really take this opportunity to say what a, what a privilege it has been to witness um, this duo uh, uh, dancing, a very, very subtle dance of ideas, of uh, wisdom flowing uh, today. Uh, this is what universities are all about, and, and I, I, I found, Nelson, that particularly your final comment, is exactly what resonates with us. Uh, because universities are this magical place where people from many generations come together, and it's through the free flow of ideas, the challenge of ideas, and the ability to disagree respectfully, which is what you were talking about, talk to each other. This is what creates this magic of universities where we take you know, very promising young people, like many of the ones who are here, put them together with very talented faculty, occasionally supplement that interaction with outstanding guests and leaders from our community. You put that together in a context of staff and administrators who want to make this run, and then magic happens. Those talented young people become outstanding leaders, and then they go out to the world and change it for the better. Once in a while, a few of them drop out and still go out <laughs> and change the world for the better. But it is just you know, the proof of the concept that actually uh, you, can, you can do uh, great things through multiple paths. But this is one path that, uh, that we're very proud to, to have at this university. And, uh, and I thought that, that, um, th that this last point about how a polarization gets people or stops people from talking to each other leads to the dismissal of alternative ideas. This is something we're really committed to try to combat here and create a climate of absolute freedom of inquiry and freedom of expression so that we can discuss ideas and then enrich each other through our differences, not through our unanimity. So I really want to thank you, Nelson, very much for sharing your wisdom tonight. I want, of course, to welcome everyone. I want to uh, thank Dean Ellis Apple for being our great and gracious host that she always is. And last but not least, I want to thank Stuart Miller, who's truly one of the most important figures in our university, he and his family, uh, for having provided us the great gift of bringing Nelson Peltz with us tonight and making this moment that I think we have all enjoyed thoroughly possible. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Please join us outside for a reception.